Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Well, good, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for making it uh, early to this session. Um, my name is Will Simonson. I'm at the Organic Research Center. I'm one of the agroforestry uh, researchers there. And we have this uh, session on trees, climate change, and resilience. And I think for, for me, and I think for all of us, this is a really important topic. I don't think I've been to any session yet here at the show which hasn't, in a sense, featured climate change in some way when it hasn't been brought up. I think it is so important that we are thinking about it and planning for it. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, joined by Peter Aspin and Andy Dibbon. So they're, they're two farmers working at the, the coal face of climate change, if you like. So I think the real meat of this uh, session is to really hear about their experience from very con you know, usefully contrasting um, systems, agroforestry systems that they've been developing and working with uh, in the context of climate change. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the climate change has been a big part of my research career. Um, before joining the Organic Research Centre, I was working for an environment and development charity in their climate change unit and focusing on nature-based um, approaches to adapting to climate change. And that's continued uh, to become an interest in my current role at the Organic Research Centre. I think we're all becoming quite familiar with um, maps like this one, which emphasise that climate change is not just something in the future that we worry about. It's actually very much it's with us today. This is a map showing um, in June 2018 um, the amount of rainfall that month. So there were small areas that received less than 2% of the expected rainfall. Uh, this is the 1981 to 2010 average. Um, some more areas that receive less than 5% of the expected rainfall. Most of England receive less than a third uh, of rainfall, according to that historic average. And then the next month, July 2018, this is a photo of a, a crop fire in, uh, near Roxby, uh, near Scunthorpe in North Lincolnshire. Um, and we are seeing uh, wildfires not just in the sort of moorlands and heathlands, um, but also increasingly in croplands. Just last year, I live in South Cambridgeshire, there were about four crop fires uh, coinciding with that you know, heat wave that we had just in my local area. So it's kind of something that we're seeing more and more. And that's something that the climate models are also predicting. So that's what this, um, these maps show, the baseline, the present day on the left-hand side where any, any one year we can expect between 0.1 and 1% of, of the days of the year to have a very high risk of fire. Under a two degree warming scenario, uh, we're looking at about 10 to 15% of uh, days having that high risk. And uh, that's quite you know, possible that we'll be seeing that in a few decades time. In a four degree scenario, this is one of the worst case scenarios, I guess, um, which would be possible before the end of the century, we're looking at 20 to 30% of days having a very high risk of fire. I was just reading a report the other day about how um, some Mediterranean style fire units are being set up using um, being trained up in skills from southern Europe and US. And that just emphasizes one threat that we might not have imagined being particularly important for, for farming, for agroforestry in the future. But I found that quite, quite interesting and sobering. Um, I suppose the other thing to say about these sort of extreme events and their, their impacts is that, you know, whereas at one time you couldn't really say that any one was um, definitely a result of climate change, um, increasingly we're he hearing that language change, aren't we? And there's this um, initiative called, it's called the World Weather Attribution, and it's a group of academics from the Imperial College London, but also some other universities who are actually modelling and monitoring these weather events. And increasingly they're using language not just that these events are more likely under climate change, but they're almost impossible to, to have happened without climate change being a factor in them. So, um, so that's you know, something that, that we are seeing, isn't it? And of course, as well as the um, extreme. So um, just um, some more maps to show very quickly. So as well as um, wildfire risk, there's the spring droughts that farmers have been um, experiencing as well. And again, some, a series, series of maps here um, showing, in this case, March, April, and May rainfall deficits in 2020. And 
large parts of the country only received about um, a third to a fifth of the expected rainfall in, in those spring months. So, um, so that's something that is, you know, really actually very um, significant for agroforestry when you're establishing new trees in the ground in the winter and then you're wanting some nice rainfall to keep them going in those early months and years. Um, yeah, but as well as the kind of extreme sort of weather events, the more erratic weather that we're seeing, of course there's the general kind of climate uh, change trends that we're witnessing, aren't there? And there's different ways of portraying that. Th this graph just shows the average global temperature for each month, the month going around this, this circle. Um, so, and it's from 1850 to 2017. The early years are, um, are actually colored blue. Um, the later years colored to orangey red. As you go out from the middle of the center, that's the increasing temperature. So you see in a, in a way, this is illustrating almost like a spiraling kind of temperature increase over time. Records are being broken all the, all the time, aren't they? So this is undeniably the sort of part of the um, climate change that we're experiencing. So in response to climate change, tree planting has become quite a key policy objective that we're seeing. Um, contributing to the sort of net, net zero targets for the UK. So, for example, the 25-year environment plan of 2018 sees this target to increase woodland cover in England by 12% um, cover by 2060, planting 180,000 hectares by the end of 2042. There's the um, Climate Change uh, Committee, the UK Climate Change Committee, which advises government in a 2020 um, land use policies report. They suggest that the forest cover needs to uh, needs to increase to at least 17 percent of the UK's land area to, by 2050, uh, planting 90 to 120 million trees per year by 2025. In another report by that same group late um, that same year as well, um, they start to reference kind of farmlands. So um, they suggest that plant, plant trees need to be planted on 10 percent of farmland while maintaining uh, the primary use in extending hedgerows by 20% by 2035. The uh, England Trees Action Plan um, that was um, produced, um, so I should say actually these targets I'm showing are a mixture of UK and England, in this case sort of England here, but that, that plan talks about agroforestry and it says plays an important role in delivering more trees on farms and in our landscape, improving climate resilience and encouraging more wildlife and biodiversity. Um, and then the, the net zero strategy of 2021, again, um, a, a target for forestry cover and areas of um, planting that needs to sort of happen. Again, back to focusing on woodlands in that case, um, the Environment Act of 2021 has further, further targets. So, so yeah, climate, Trees in, in the sort of frame, really, as a, as a sort of response, as an answer to climate change, um, particularly for, for mitigating climate change, for lo locking up that carbon, and we've been talking about that in some of the sessions here at the show uh, these couple of days. So sometimes it's, they refer to as a nature-based solution. I'm sure people are coming across that, that sort of term more and more. Um, it's really one sort of journal sort of uh, commentary talking about this amazing nanotechnology carbon capture solution that comes in a, a tiny dirt cheap package and uses internally stored energy to send threads questing down and up and those upward threads um, make lots of little solar panels and, and, get, and on it goes and of course it's describing you know this amazing carbon capture technology is in fact a tree and um, it just sort of emphasizes the fact that you know we don't have to um, kind of just turn to high tech for this, this kind of challenge that, that humanity is facing. Um, so, and of course the trees aren't just helping to, to mitigate climate change, but helping to adapt to, to climate change as well. And I think that's really in a sense the focus of, of this session, one of the focuses. And so what we're gonna be hearing about from, from Andy and from Peter is some of those climate change adaptation benefits that they're, they're seeing from their systems, that they, indeed they, they've, um, you know, doing agroforestry for one of the purposes of it, one of the key things that they feel bring, bring to their systems. So that's something we're going to be exploring uh, in detail a bit later. Um, but, 
You know, if it's as simple as planting trees for climate change mitigation and adaptation, what could possibly go wrong? Um, and I think there's a lot, actually, that, that could go wrong. And I think, hopefully, you know, I think the practical sessions uh, and the talks of this show are actually helping to uh, tool people up, really, in some of the kind of pitfalls, some of the challenges. It's not a sort of trees on farms isn't a panacea. It's not a kind of easy option. Um, and there's, you know, lots of challenges, particularly in a climate change context with agroforestry. So there's disease. Not that all disease is associated with climate change, but there are diseases which spread further and faster with climate change. Um, one example is the emerald ash borer beetle, uh, uh, um, which attacks the ash trees, which are already affected by ash dieback, of course. And this is a species that's not native for, to Europe, but is, is threatening to spread. And it actually features in the National Risk Register for, for the UK now. So that's kind of one of the sort of pests and diseases that are being, uh, being watched. Um, but, you know, so there's pests and diseases. There's, you know, the erratic weather is causing flooding, waterlogging. Um, that's an issue. And also, of course, the droughts that we've already mentioned, the summer droughts, the spring droughts. This is a challenge to especially young systems before the trees are pro properly establishing and putting their roots down. Um, this is something that's really impacting on tree survival rates. So I think what this is saying to me, and I've, this is what I've been sort of really thinking about for quite a while, is that, sure, agroforestry is a you know, really important kind of approach for climate change adaptation. But in order for that to be successful, um, the design of that agroforestry has to be resilient to climate change because trees aren't, you know, they're not just inert infrastructure, a bit like a concrete flood wall or something like that. These are living organisms that are affected by warming trends, uh, drying or um, wetting trends, you know, the, the erratic weather. So agroforestry has to be resilient in itself, in its design. The trees have to be able to survive in order to be able to confer those adaptation benefits down the line for the, the whole farm system. And that's, uh, I guess, what I hope we can also explore a little bit through the experience of, of Peter and Andy and what they've seen works and doesn't work um, as we're going forward. And of course, bu building resilience, it's, um, as you might imagine, there's a whole sort of science behind that, um, not just an ecological uh, concept, but a sort of socio-economic one as well. And this is just one example. This is a, a report um, or guidance book, really, I suppose, called Applying Resilience Thinking. And it takes some of that kind of academic literature and it distills it down into seven, seven principles for how you build resilience. And I think that those are actually quite relevant to the, the farm, farm level, also to the farming communities, to, to landscapes, to indeed to, to society. But those, those principles include things like maintaining diversity and redundancy. And, and one can imagine, start to imagine what that might mean for a farm and for agroforestry. Uh, managing connectivity is another one. Uh, encouraging learning, so it's you know getting to that whole sort of experience of sharing knowledge, and indeed that's what this show is about. Again, is hopefully what this session is doing to a wee degree as well. Um, broadening participation in, in um, as another kind of approach to building resilience. So um, this session. Um, so I think what I want us to do in the, in the time that we got this morning is to to think about you know what are the adaptation benefits of agroforestry, and then how can we build resilience into agroforestry design? And um, as I said, I think we're going to be learning a lot from Peter and Andy's experience. I'm sure there's lots of actually experience and expertise in this room, so um, I'm really hoping that we can have a, a lot of time for some discussion and Q&A towards the end. But the, what we'll be hearing um, about, first of all, is a civil horticulture operation. So Andy Dibbon is the head grower at Abbey Home Farm near Simon Cess in Gloucester. He's going to be talking about his, his experience. And um, you know, he, this is somebody who's really thought through his system and, and has been fantastic at, at kind of communicating about it. So I'm really looking forward to sort of um, hearing him this morning. And then we're going to be hearing from Peter Aspin, so talking about his uh, silver, silver pasture project in, in Shropshire. And again, um, Peter's been really ahead of the curve. He's been doing agroforestry for over, over 20 years now. and doing some really quite innovative experimental things. I, I, I hope it's fair to say, Peter. And so I think, you know, hopefully we can um, learn a lot about that. Um, and then, as I said, I'm hoping we, we'll have a good spell at the end for some, for some discussion. But just before that, um, I just wanted to 
really signpost people to what's going on a, on a research point of view, and that's kind of where I'm, the kind of uh, community I'm in, I suppose. And um, to say that um, there's, yeah, these collaborations across Europe funded by Horizon. Um, just heard this morning, by the way, that I think UK is rejoining the Horizon program um, after many, well, what feels like many years of waiting for that confirmation. So that's really great news. But we are indeed already participating uh, in Horizon projects. Um, so uh, there's AgroMix, which is all about mixed farming and agroforestry and their resilience benefits. Uh, there's the Re Livestock um, project. And you can hear about that. Some of the real livestock team are speaking at 11 o'clock in the Sainsbury tent on, on uh, benefits of trees for resilient livestock systems. Uh, this reforest, a new, well, relatively new, one year in, uh, four year project on agroforestry, focusing on the carbon, the climate change mitigation benefits, as well as biodiversity. So do find out about those projects. There's the, the stands of Coventry and um, Cranfield and Reading University. There's the Organic Research Center stand. Do come and find us. Um, to hear more about that, that work that's really relevant to the topic that we're talking about uh, this morning. Um, there's also, um, I've been really interested by what forest research um, are doing, um, and there's a number of resources, there's some really interesting modeling and, and research going on. Um, I nabbed um, Pike, Mike Parks, um, the principal scientist at Forest Research for Climate Change, yesterday afternoon, and just asked whether he might be able to just come up for a few minutes just to say what some, some of what he's doing, what the, his team are doing, and how that could be relevant to, to agroforestry. And I think you've got a session later on, Mike, as well, which you might want to tell about. Do you want to just come up to uh, speak for, about that for a few minutes? Thanks. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, Mike Perks, Principal Scientist, Forest Research, based in Edinburgh. Um, what we're working on in terms of uh, the climate mitigation benefits of agroforestry is we're developing, improving existing uh, carbon calculations of the net benefit of trees on agricultural sites. Um, that, at the moment, that's under a call down service with DEFRA, um, under an NCF funded project, which is a two year project. Uh, but we're also working with um, uh, uh, partners at Cranfield and um, Verna Earth, who are an SME, very good at spatial data integration, for a DESNES project, which the main focus of the DESNES project is biomass provision. Where can we put trees in the landscape? So it's not ag purely agroforestry focused, but obviously that, that gives us the opportunity to put some time and resource down to representing agroforestry much better in our tools. We've got a talk at one o'clock um, in the Sainsbury's tent, do come along and have a listen. Um, we'll also have the opportunity in af after that session for people to use the tools. Um, but, so there's a suite of tools there. There's the Forest Research Ecological Site Classification, which matches tree species to site, if you know something about your soils. Um, it also is now functioning with future climate data, so we can start providing you with some security in your decision making over the rotation length. Um, Werner Earth have got a tool which will become available, it's still in development, it's a web-based tool which you can basically put your farm in and it will help you decide where best to put trees. Um, it is built on the ecological site classification platform, the spatial tool just uh, layers all of the constraints that you might have. Um, and then Cranfield University, Paul Burgess, We'll be talking through the um, yield and economic calculators that Cranfield have produced, which help you make financial di financial choices. Um, and all these things are really merging as part of this next project. So we can talk to you about that at more depth at one o'clock. Thanks, Will. Brilliant. Oh, I should say, and Will is working with the ORC. And for this call down service for DEFRA, we're working in partnership with the Agroforestry Carbon Code to use that as a sense check to our modelling developments for, for DEFRA schemes. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, and finally, um, this is the kind of resource that I find quite interesting. I mean, it's actually, for, in a sense, for urban, urban context, but there's some quite interesting sort of learnings, I think, from that. The um, Trees and Design Action Group Tree Species Selection for Green Infrastructure Report, and it has um, about 280 tree profiles within that got a tree selector tool as well um, and you can sort of screen trees depending on their use potential their mature size crown form 
um, form, crown density, environmental tolerance to shading and to, to drought and to waterlogging, uh, ornamental quality as well. Obviously, you know, this is for urban situations, so quite different. But, you know, I think the thought process is, is pretty similar to some of the sort of thinking that agroforesters also need to go through. So, um, great. I think um, just before handing over to Andy, uh, one other thing um, to point you to is to a couple of sessions at 3 o'clock talking about the research. There's, uh, there's one featuring Reading University in particular, another one with, um, I think it's uh, Cran... No, Coventry, I was also saying Coventry, Coventry University in Abacus Agriculture, uh, kind of a co design exercise for research privatization. So you might want to think about going to either one of those. But over to Andy, really, to talk about what he's been doing at Abbey Home Farm. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming and listening. Uh, my name is Andy. I'm an organic veg farmer. Uh, I luckily live, just live and work just 20 minutes up the road, so it's a nice, easy event for me. Um, Previous to being an organic veg farmer, um, I used to be a coppice worker for about five or six years. So actually my first love professionally was trees and woodland. And then being a coppice worker doesn't uh, basically provide you with the money to raise two kids. So I moved back into farming, which I'd grown up on a farm as a shepherd, and then moved into um, organic horticulture. And then about when I moved to the farm where I work now, about 10 years ago, I got the, the lovely opportunity to combine my two loves, which was horticulture and trees, uh, into a silvo horticultural system. It's really nice to come and speak here. Like, a, 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 in a lot of agroforestry discussions, it's silvo arable and silver pasture, and they're the two big ones. So it's, it's nice to get a little shout in for horticulture. And in fact, I passionately believe with um, agroforestry, in the case of horticulture, it's a really dynamic, incredibly powerful, multifaceted tool. Uh, and I'm going to go through that now. Um, just as an example, as a horticulturalist, um, I grow 90 different kinds of fruit and veg. So the way trees interact with my crops comes in a vast array of styles and situations. Um, as a brief overview, we've got an intensive market garden doing high value salad crops. I've got a thousand metres squared of glass house growing high value and, and uh, extending the season. Um, we've got a lot of polytunnels as well and then we have a large area field scale. We started putting uh, agroforestry into our field scale. We'd started designing it seven years ago, started planting it six years ago and planted over three years. Um, the system's still very young, but the design process very much took into account the subject we're going to talk about today. Um, in the last two years, we've also started introducing agroforestry into our glasshouse. So doing it inside protected cropping as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So climate change resilience, um, I get, whenever I do a guided tour at the farm around the agroforestry, almost straight away, one of the first questions I get asked at the end of the tour or during the tour is, have you seen an increase in your yields yet? Now, bearing in mind these trees I kind of planted as hedge whips, about that big, and they're now, I don't know, uh, six, the oldest ones will be six years old. The simple answer is they've barely got big enough to even start attempting to affect the yields. Agroforestry is a long-term thing. Anyone looking for an instant financial return on it is kidding themselves. It's a long-term investment, both for benefits to your crops, but also financially. Um, and in fact, in the last three or four years, with the intensity of the weather we're seeing, I've actually changed my tune completely now. And with all my organic sustainable techniques and with agroforestry, I don't actually, I'm not actually looking to increase my yields anymore. And not to be put too much of a downer on it, but it's important as a food producer that I say this. In the last three or four years, I've now changed my attitude and agroforestry and all my organic techniques are about clinging on to yields, good yields, commercial yields, in the face of savage weather events. You know, I, ironically, I spent the winter this winter planning for a 50 degree centigrade summer and got the exact opposite. So one of the challenges is you're not planning for one kind of weather. In England, we're not planning for one weather change. If you look at Italy, you've got parts of Italy that are 60 miles apart. Some have lost all of their crops to drought. 60 miles up the road, they've lost all of their crops to flood. So it's climate change resilience is a tricky thing to plan for. Every, and I'm passionate about this subject as well. And this is why I like talking about the subject as much as possible. Every farm is unique. Agroforestry offers loads and loads of benefits, but those benefits are very site specific. So if you're going onto a site, a, a, a brand new greenfield site, and you want to put agroforestry in, 
what I tell people is when you walk in there, I do consultancy on it, you walk in the field and you go, right, what problems can trees solve for me in this field? And that'll be very different depending on the field. If it's a steep slope field, you're probably talking about soil erosion. If it's a coastal field, you're probably talking about wind protection. On, on a lot of sites, it'll be all of these things, but your system design really has to take into account your own site. I don't believe in taking designs off the shelf that are used on other farms. Uh, and I passionately believe the best people to design systems are the farmers themselves who know their sites inside out and they know the requirement of their crops and their routes to market. Um, different routes to market require completely different cropping systems in horticulture, uh, different harvesting times, everything about it is de defined by route to market. My route to market is a farm shop and a cafe. Uh, all of what I grow goes out through the farm shop. We sell a tiny bit of excess off. So I'm very lucky that it's direct sales. I get good money for it, good communication with the customers. We reckon we, feel, we feed about 800 people a week with all of their veg uh, for 12 months of the year, basically. The rest of the farm does meat, dairy, arable and all of that, but I just do the fruit and veg. So as far as climate change resilience and design of the system goes, when I designed the system, we'd had a... Weather was starting, you know, seven or eight years ago, the weather was starting to kind of hot up or wet up, depending on what sort of year it was. But it was actually after we designed the system that we started to get really, really commercially threatening, uh, damaging weather events. Interestingly, though, a lot of the things we looked to alleviate, I was looking to alleviate within the system for horticulture when I designed it, all happened to be things that are becoming more and more relevant now. So the first bit of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the things that I designed into the system. In the second part, I'm going to talk about all the stuff I learnt after I designed the system that we're now, as we put in more agroforestry across the farm, we're now working this into our design as well. The big, the big driving factor for me when I arrived at the new farm where I work instantly to put trees in is it's up on the, it's 20 minutes north, but it's up a steep hill from here, sat at the sort of beginning of the Cotswolds, very exposed to wind. Basically, wind comes howling up the Bristol Channel and continuously goes uphill straight until it hits our farm. Uh, and wind and veg don't mix, you know? It's pretty bad in arable, but in veg, it's really, really challenging um, with wind. So a lot of our um, design was around wind breaks in the cropping areas. Um, and as we all know, wind is one of these big things with climate change. We're getting more storms, and the, storm, the wind storms are much, much stronger and we're getting them at weird times of years. In the case of trees, we're getting them in the summer when the trees are fully out in leaf, and that's a big problem for young trees. I've lost quite a lot of young trees in summer gales. Um, uh, for the veg, uh, if you're trying to extend your season, grow early in the season, like early spring outside or late autumn outside, wind chills are a big factor for veg, okay? It can handle the cold if you're growing the right things, like cabbages and stuff like that. But if you've got a savagely cold, bitter wind chill, that slows everything down. It damages the visual quality of the crops as well. So reducing the wind would reduce wind chill. Um, in the summer, in the hot weather events, it will reduce, reducing the wind will reduce evaporation. Um, it will also reduce soil erosion. If it's a dry, dusty field and you've got a howling wind, you watch all your topsoil blowing over the hedge. So putting in wind breaks keeps the soil where we want it. It also stops that evaporation. And again, it, uh, my horticulture is all irrigated. Um, but we are constantly getting squeezed by the Environment Agency on our abstraction licence for our borehole, and that's going to get worse and worse over the, over the next 10, 20 years. So everything we can do to reduce our water usage, we're really interested in. Um, and trees are a big part of that. Um, and like I said, reducing this wind will maintain yields and visual quality. In system design terms, reducing, we want to reduce wind, not remove it. If, you, if, you, if you're designing windbreaks with trees, don't imagine you're going to try and design a solid wall of trees because what that creates is really bad turbulence on the downwind side of the trees. It can actually cause more damage than the wind would have done in the first place. So you want wind breaks, not wind blocks. Um, tree spacing is really important for that, depending on the varieties of trees you're using, the thickness of the tree belts you're using in your system, but you still want spaces in those trees so it's a wind break, not a wind block. Um, something I'm happy to answer questions about later is phasing. So this is something very particular to horticulture. So if your agroforestry system involves coppicing, um, when do you coppice those trees? Uh, in short, for us, we've got a five-year veg rotation in the field, and we coppice our alder and our hazel trees on a five-year cycle, and we coppice them upwind of the cropping areas 
when we have a green manure established in that area, which requires no windbreak. So when we remove our windbreak, that field downwind doesn't have a wind susceptible crop in it. Um, talked about turbulence. Pollination, again, if you remove the wind completely, all your wind pollinated crops start to struggle. So you need wind movement in your cropping areas. That's something we can struggle with in the glass house where we never have wind. Uh, and reducing wind reduces temperatures as well. Um, well, uh, reducing wind will do, does two ways. It will reduce, uh, it will raise the temperature in the winter, but also if we reduce the wind in the summer, it just keeps the cropping areas much stable. Hot, dry winds equal loads of transpiration from the crop. Again, more water usage. Um, water itself. So I always say tr uh, trees are nature's soak away. You know, we, we put soak aways around our buildings, but trees do exactly the same in a natural way. Um, the really cool thing about trees is they can manage excess water and they can manage lack of water. Excess water is managed through the soak away effect. Um, lack of water, all the fungal relationships and the organic matter dropped by the leaves from the tree, the, the leaves from the tree dropping the floor, boost soil organic matter. You boost soil organic matter and you boost soil life, your soil is much more capable of hanging on to water. Um, and this is important in the system design. One of the early proponents of, of silver horticulture was Wakelin's agroforestry. They did a lot of experiments with willow biomass either side of potato crops. In the hot years, they found that willow biomass robbed loads of water off the potato crops and massively reduced the yields. So when we designed our system, we were very careful about where we put willow, which is a very, very hungry tree. It's a great tree for wildlife. It's a great tree for biomass, but it's a very thirsty tree. Great in a really wet corner of the field, that'll help you out, but not right next to a really thirsty crop. So again, tree alley spacings, tree spacings and tree choice is very important to make sure you're not robbing this interaction between trees and crops in horticulture is very dynamic and it changes at different times of year. So it's very important when you're designing a system to think it all the way through 12 months of the year and for me, all the way through a five year rotation as well. Heat, so you can see today, it's lovely and hot. A couple of facts, a potato crop experiences heat stress over 15 degrees centigrade. A tomato crop inside experiences heat stress over 30 degrees. Last year, my potato crop got up to 39 degrees centigrade and my glass house went up to, I think the, the, the record temperature last year was 49 degrees. So these key crops for me are not happy with the heat. Now, um, the best way of reducing heat in cropping areas is shade, basically. But I need shade in the right place at the right time. As a horticulturalist, photosynthesis is my most important system that I'm working with. In the winter, light is a really valuable currency, especially when you get to midwinter's day. We've got short day length, low sun height. We need to do everything to maximise light, light, maximize light getting on the crop. Uh, vice versa, in the height of the summer, we want to maximise shade. So in the glass house, we've just started planting fan-trained peaches up between all our rotation bays. Um, the key thing there is they're a deciduous tree. So in the summer, when it's really, really hot, they cast dappled shade in the glass house. That drops the temperature in the glass house. In the winter, when we do a lot of cropping in the glass house, we want maximum light penetration to the crop. There's no leaves on those trees. So they're not robbing any of the light from the crop. So it's, it's a, a dynamic tool. We didn't plan that into outside because I hadn't experienced really extreme heat yet. It is something we will be planning into future systems, especially in the intensive market garden, where leafy crops don't really like really, really intense summer sunshine. Um, and again, system tree choice is really important. Like I said, for, for heat, the, the, the kind of tree you're, you're planting, the amount of shade it casts, again, the spacing. I want some light getting into my crops. The orientation of your tree rows is really, really important in horticulture. Generally, we go for a north-south aspect so that we get every, every crop gets sunshine through the day. Minimum half a day of sunshine, basically. First thing we did when we designed the system was clear all the veg out of the field, put the field down to a two-year green manure, and re reorientate the whole field north-south. Um, and like I said, we're just designing, designing a system in the market garden that's going to be very much based around shade, basically. Uh, perennials. Last year, when it got up to 40 degrees on the farm, I was walking around, well, absolutely killing myself, dragging irrigation pipes around for three months, uh, desperately watching by the millilitre that we weren't going over our abstraction limit, but wanting to go way over it. While I was doing all this, really, really working hard to grow annual vegetables, 
Meanwhile, the apple trees in my perennial, in my uh, agroforestry system, gave us the most incredible yield without me barely doing a thing to them all year. So in horticulture, we're getting increasingly interested in perennials, obviously trees, but I'm also interested in perennial veg crops. They're far more resilient to extreme weather events. They'll bounce back from flooding much quicker and they'll deal with heat for much longer. Even if they have a bad year and they get knocked back, they'll come back in the winter. You know, trees, once you get them established, are very, very resilient. On that point, the key system design thing with perennials is if you're planting a perennial and it's going to be in there, no perennials are perennial. They all, in veg, they all die eventually. They say asparagus is perennial. I've never got any, any asparagus bed beyond 11 years, ever. Um, so it, uh, commercial perennials, the key bit, if it's going to be in for 10 years in an organic system, you've got to establish it well. There's got to be really good weed control before you do it and the early years of doing it. And water is really, really important. So the one thing I'd say about establishing trees that we've learned in agroforestry systems is don't leave it until March. It's too late now. Will was talking about spring droughts. If you start planting in March, and we get a spring drought, you'll lose 80% of your trees, unless you can water them. We're lucky that our system design matched the tree spacing with our irrigation boom set up. So whenever we irrigate tree, whenever we irrigate our veg crops in the field, we have taps on the end of the irrigation boom that will water the tree lines at the same time. And that efficient system design thing is really, really important. You don't want to create a whole other workload that is trees. You want to integrate it into your existing system so it doesn't take up loads more of your time. Reducing inputs. So if we're going to have to, I mean, yesterday Russia and Saudi agreed not to export much more oil this year. That's going to keep carbon... Um, Fossil fuel price is really, really high. That's not well, it's already driven the cost of agricultural inputs through the roof, basically to an unsustainable level. Um, the key thing for me on the farm, so our system design in the field scale was designed about two things, well, uh, many things, but two of the things were um, reducing inputs. Now, I'm an organic farmer. I don't use pesticides, never have, wouldn't want to. Insects are amazingly powerful and important. It's the opposite. I, I, the insects are my crucial pest control tool. So we actively farm insects. And some of our tree choice isn't for harvesting. It's not top fruit. It's not coppice. It's just untouched wildlife trees. And we've picked a succession of pollen for early spring that brings predators and pollinators right in amongst cropping. And it's the final part of wildlife corridors. Everyone talks about hedgerows, woodlands, interconnecting farms. If you're an organic farmer, you need to bring all of that biodiversity. And it's not a charitable exercise. It's a commercially competitive exercise. I want to bring all those insects, predators, pollinators, all those birds, right in amongst my cropping. They're a really powerful tool. It's not a charitable exercise at all. Fertility, we've got alder and coppice, alder and hazel on a five-year rotation. We haven't cut it yet, but we will be cutting it. And that will be for wood chip, which we use for pure wood chip composted for three years for propagation compost. And then either fresh or one year composted wood chip, which we apply straight to cover crops as a ramule wood chip application to boost soil organic matter in the fields. Economic resilience and future proofing. Relying on imports is risky. The more crops I can grow on my farm, the, re the less crops I have to import. We quite often import crops through the year from Italy, Spain, maybe Greece. Not this year, because there are no crops down there. So we need to be building that local and national infrastructure for food production more and more, because we're going to be getting less and less from the Mediterranean, where we get a lot at the moment. Um, crop yeah, that's like I said, crop diversification on farm and nationally. System design-wise, get your trees established before the weather intensifies even more. I don't want to be planting a tree in 10 years. I tell you what, in 10 years, it's going to be very hard establishing trees without a lot of water. So there is a certain time element. Design process is really, really important, but time is an issue at the moment. So, like I said, 10, 15 years, establishing trees is going to be difficult. Um, tree choice, tree provenance. Am I planting almonds and olives in my next planting? These are all questions I'm asking myself at the moment. And that's it. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thanks very much, Andy. That was, that was fascinating. Um, so I think we... I mean, I'm sure you've got lots of kind of questions that you'd like to follow up on on that, but let's, let's move on straight to Peter now, and then we're going to, as I said, have a time for questions and for discussion. 
towards the end. So, um, Peter, thank you. Yeah, quite a few of Andy's experiences, Al. Uh, uh, similar to mine, but uh, obviously using, uh, using animals, using livestock. Um, yeah, uh, let's start off, um, I've, the basis of what we're doing here. Uh, I, uh, I've always been appalled how, how uh, farmers in, in this country keep animals in, on, on field systems in, in, in summertime, uh, well, and spring and autumn. When the weather's good, clement or whatever, obviously it's not a problem, but when it's uh, absolutely throwing it down, or days like today, uh, you just need to ask, look in the back of a, a Nackerman's lorry and see how many corpses there are. And uh, if you ask the driver what he thinks of, uh, of livestock farmers in this country, uh, it's, uh, you get a gob full of expletives. So uh, uh, the idea was to create a, a system where the, the, the cattle, the livestock, are in a much more um, amenable, uh, better environment uh, throughout the year, throughout the grazing season. Uh, the first thing we did when we moved to the farm in, in 82 was um, allow all the hedgerows to uh, grow. They were all these stunted little hedgerows you s used to see around arable and livestock fields, three foot tall, whatever. Uh, we allowed them to grow to about eight, ten foot tall and probably a metre, two metres wide. So providing a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of shelter. Um, we incorporated uh, in various places a lot of holly. Holly is, is the best. Uh, uh, the, the best hedgerow tree, uh, far better than uh, the hawthorn or, or blackthorn or whatever, because it's, uh, it's edible as well as, uh, as uh, a preventative measure. Um, right, you've got, you've got the picture there. Uh, I, we just contract rearing dairy heifers now, and we only have them from about April till uh, November, December. And um, so you can see the picture there. The trees are. Right, these are all um, uh, very pregnant heifers. Uh, in fact, uh, two days ago, five, five left to, uh, about to calve, and another five that have just been uh, PD positive uh, came back to the farm. Um, so you can see the trees there. The alleys are 20 metres wide. Uh, it's a very small farm, 20 acres. Well, it was 20 acres when I uh, started the work 20 odd years ago, but it, we bought a bit more land after that. But the actual, actual agroforestry is only on 20 acres. So uh, uh, you can see how the trees there have developed. We never actually, no, not never, we very rarely plant two trees of the spe same species next to each other. So the row, this, the row you can see there on the picture there, it's all alternate walnuts and ash. Uh, we're sampling about 40 varieties of, uh, of walnuts at present. Um, and they're all growing pretty well, they're all growing very well. Uh, right. Right, that's it without the cattle, obviously. Uh, you've got the herbage crop beneath. It's um, a mass of clover, rye grasses, uh, all sorts of things. Loads of yarrow at present flowering. And um, uh, so the, the alleys are the le pure length of the farm, 40 metres, 400 metres by 20 metres, so eight tenths of a hectare. And uh, the farm, the fields were, were all east, east west, so we had to. Uh, take all the fences up, all the existing hedgerows, and, uh, and just plant. You're looking due south on the, on the photograph there. So, um, uh, yeah, it's providing a lot of shade, a lot of shelter. You can see the uh, surrounding hedgerows are providing a lot of shade from, from wind chill as well. So uh, the best, very few farmers understand the concept of, in my experience, understand the concept of shade and shelter. Um, the best example I, I've read in the last few years was a, uh, in a tree magazine about a farm in, um, in New Zealand, South Island, New Zealand, which is a pretty windy part of the world. And, uh, and the guy who was, uh, had uh, uh, sheep and, and cattle uh, and had planted um, shelter belts all the way through the farm, all over the farm. And uh, when he came to retire, a dairy farmer took over the farm and he, he thought these shelter belt belts were a complete and utter waste of space, so he just dug them up. And uh, he found out within a few years that he'd never, ever managed to get the same amount of, uh, of livestock units per hectare. Because although he had probably about 20% more land, he never got anywhere near the, uh, the livestock units that the previous, uh, the previous uh, sheep and, and cattle farm had. So uh, in this country, I really don't know of very, very few, well, I don't know any person in Shropshire who knows about the concept of shared and shelter. 
Uh, and you mentioned about wind, uh, as the differential between high and low pressure increases, which is possibly more likely than actually temperature increase, then the, the wind effect, the wind frequency and the wind strength will, uh, uh, will increase. And uh, of, all the, uh, of all the trees we can grow in Britain, there's only one that's really completely wind resistant, and, and that's the Araucaria. So um, uh, traditionally, it's uh, used for ship's mass, tremendous timber, and uh, it's probably the most in important nut tree we can grow in Britain uh, because it's uh, most nuts, hazelnuts, walnuts, and chestnuts, stuff like that, are about 30% oil, 30% fat whereas uh, uh, the Araucarias are only about 5%. So from a health point of view, it's probably the, the healthiest nut we can eat. And we talk about the big problems with staple foods like um, uh, potatoes, rice, and so on. But this potentially is the most important, uh, one of the most important staple foods on the planet. Uh, the native uh, Indians down in, uh, native South Americans down in the South Island, uh, down at the south end of uh, of uh, Chile, Patagonia and so on, they can use this almost exclusively as a food source. Right, the effect, effects of wind damage. <laughs> uh, you can see both these conifers uh, have been completely, the leaves have been completely blown out. We're, uh, the farm is right at the top end, north end of Shropshire, so we, most people think of Shropshire, Wenlock Edge, the Long Men, Cypress and so on, but we're actually geologically in the, uh, uh, on the Cheshire Plain very flat apart from a few resistant outliers. So um, there's nothing between where we are and the Welsh Hills about 20 miles away, to, 20 miles to the west to provide shelter. So uh, these, both, uh, one of these is a big cone pine, I'm not sure which the other one is, but they both had leaders blown out two or three years ago. And um, if there's one role that the organisations like the Woodland Trust should be doing now, is to uh, source mother trees, seed source trees, where you can actually grow trees that are wind resistant, because that possibly is going to be the most important factor we're going to have to, have to look at in the future. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, well, obviously, they're both, both grown for pine nuts, these trees. So uh, um, yeah, we go on to the next one. Is You mentioned summer damage, Andy. Uh, on the left is an ash tree, which was. Uh, uh, one August day two years ago, one side of it completely blew out. And if you're pruning trees in uh, in winter, it's quite easy to do. All you've got to do is remove the uh, the wood. If you have to remove half a, half a ash tree like that on a summer's day, it's not a lot of fun because you've got a lot of foliage to deal with and so on. Next to it is a gladitzia, uh, which is um, uh, you. In an agroforestry system, you don't want trees to grow too fast because they'll get leggy and they'll just keel over. Uh, the gladitzia there, I looked at this tree in June and I thought to myself, that's grown far too fast this year. Two weeks later, we had a big storm and it, you can see completely blew the middle out of it. There, was a, there should have been two pictures here. One on the left was uh, an English elm dead, died two years ago. Uh, and the next picture was two witch elms uh, which together, which died, well, this year and last year, actually. Uh, they get to about 20 years old, and then they just succumb. And you've got to keep th throwing that at people who want to plant trees, that uh, uh, we need to plant more disease-resistant trees and let that be a lesson to everybody who plants trees. Uh, this is what uh, disease, man stupidity causing uh, Dutch elm disease and stuff like that uh, can do. The tree right in front there, uh, is, uh, is a, one of the most successful trees we've grown here, which is, is uh, Siberian elm, uh, almost pumula. And uh, you can see it's planted, into, well, there's a row of them there interplanted with ash. The thinner one next door is a uh, normal ash. Then there's another uh, Siberian elm there. And these have put such tremendous mass on in 20 years. Uh, obviously, elm is a tremendous timber, very dense timber. And... Uh, it goes against all the principles of agroforestry, because in agroforestry, you want trees to come into leaf uh, very late as possible, probably late May, early June. Some of our walnut varieties don't come into leaf until the end of June. And, um, but it, it leaves very early, but because it's a very small elm-like leaf, it doesn't cast much shade. 
So the whole idea of uh, silver pastoral agroforestry is you don't know, you don't want trees to cast shade until you've done a couple of rounds of grazing or the, uh, uh, the, the silage crop has grown to its full extent. So then all it has to do once it, once it starts to shade is set seed. This is, uh, this is a red uh, alder uh, that died last year, last April. No, April last year, April 2022. Um, important timber tree, absolutely dead straight, wonderful form. We just had a frosty night one day in April, just as leaf, leaf uh, emergence was occurring, it completely killed it. It wasn't a very cold night, I think it was about, only about minus four, minus five. And, uh, but it, it was just a critical time when it, uh, when it was coming to leaf and it just completely defoliated and uh, it's just, just crumbled, crumbled. So uh, unfortunately, it was only a sample of one. It was a, the only red alder I, I, I planted. So I, I can't match it against any others. But exactly a year before, in the April uh, 2021, we had two uh, Iolanthus uh, tree, trees of heaven, Iolanthus altissima. Uh, very good timber tree, very good uh, firewood tree, very good uh, charcoal tree. And uh, there were two 10 metres apart. One got hit by a frost. And the, net, the one 10 metres away from it is absolutely perfect. So again, we're going back to seed source. You know, we need to. When I, pl I started this 20 odd years ago, I just got seed from wherever I could. But we've really got to start looking at seed provenance and so on for planting these trees. Right. Um, this is an interesting picture. Uh, well, hopefully, some of them, some of the others have been interested as well. Uh, second from the second from the left is uh, is a polonia, uh, which is probably the most important. Um, uh, agroforestry tree in, in, in the forest, China, uh, Vietnam, places like that. It's probably relevant for Andy's farm. I don't know if you've got any polonies here. You have done. Yeah, because the, uh, the, the Chinese now are experimenting with, with all sorts of hybrids, uh, high yielding hybrids, and um, I managed to get some seed of, of a couple of hybrids this year uh, because the, uh, the leaf drop uh, creates a, a tremendous amount of fertility into the soil. and. Uh, I mean, most of the, I mean, as you said, about soil conditioning before, leaf drop is very important for conditioning of the soil. If you're a gardener, uh, and you, you can get some uh, compost that's made of, uh, of uh, well-rotted uh, leaf litter, that, that is the best uh, for fertilizing, conditioning the soil. It, uh, anyway, so that's Polonia. Uh, for, for the other nerds in the audience, that's uh, Polonia Fortunii. And uh, about eight, nine years ago, we had a group came, and uh, just, it was a completely misshapen tree. I, ju I just went down with this group and took a saw, saw down the field and uh, a copy stick, took it right down to the floor. And you can see now it's absolutely dead straight. So if, you, if you've got a bent tree, just copy stick and yeah, prune to one, one, uh, one, one leader. Uh, the other trees are very interesting. These are all. Um, uh, black, uh, hornbeam, hornbeam. Uh, all from there, there are four, the line of four there. You've got the one on the left, next to the plodi, you've got a very thin looking one, then you've got another one, and there's another one further on. Now, two of these hornbeams were in the normal shape. Uh, one was all out of the same packet of seed again, but obviously not sourced from the same tree. The, the fourth one was quite fastidious, quite erect. And what's happened with the one in the middle there? It uh, just defoliated in, in the very hot weather last July, August. And, uh, and this year it was um, completely blitzed by caterpillars in April. April, yeah, March, April, April, April time. And uh, you can see how sick it looks, looks now. And uh, I, I, I keep thinking about horn beams and I, I keep thinking they're the next thing they shell. So we'll see. Time will tell. You heard it here first. Right, this is a mixed row of. Um, of uh, wild service trees and liquid ambers. Uh, wild service tree is a uh, native tree, pretty rare. I mean, the best place you see it in Shropshire is on the edge, uh, Wenlock Edge, if you know it. Uh, I don't know many wild service trees down here, but it's a very valuable timber, uh, very valuable for wildlife, for flowering, and uh, uh, loads of large berries on it, the, uh, the uh, red wings and, and so on, gold bananas at, at it in the autumn. Um, and interplanted there. Incidentally, some of the uh, wild service trees, because it was such a dry, uh, dry May this year, some of the uh, wild service trees were dropping leaves in, uh, at the end of May, which is quite remarkable. I've never seen it before. 
Uh, they're used plenty with liquid ambers, which obviously are not native trees, but they're a very important tree. I mean, one of the unders undersourced products of, uh, of trees are, uh, are tree sap, and obviously you get stuff like balsam and so on from uh, liquid ambers. So, uh, uh, yeah, the wild service tree is actually probably the most consistent tree for growth rates on the farm whereas uh, other trees can be variable from one tree to the next, while service trees can be very consistent. Right. These are hybrid walnuts. These are um, the six hybrid walnuts there interplanted with ash again. You can see the, uh, uh, the, the, the walnuts are, are keeping up growth rates, actually, with the ash. I'm quite surprised about that. But they are a uh, French variety hybrid of black and, uh, and common walnuts, and um, I think one of them is still available, NG23, but I don't think the other is available anymore, NG38. I think it's probably been superseded. But as you can see, they've grown very tall, very straight, uh, very wind resistant, but they haven't put a lot of mass on yet. Uh, in, in terms of girth, the English elm, the Siberian elm was shown earlier, and, uh, and some of the ash trees are, uh, are probably a, a diameter of about 10, 12 inches, whereas these are only about about five inches after 20 years. So uh, another tree, we, we need to grow timber in this country. As, as, as been said, you know, 90, we're the second biggest importer of timber in the world. And in 50 years time, we're not gonna be able to buy timber from anywhere in the world. Uh, if we want to buy timber, we're gonna have to borrow the money to buy the timber. So uh, we are gonna, really gonna have to start changing the whole way we, we farm, uh, the whole way we farm. Uh, with using trees for the, the interplanting and so on. Right, uh, have we any left? Right, uh, again, uh, Will asked me to just take some pictures of some of the trees we're, we're sampling again. Uh, on the left, outside left and outside right, same like a football team, uh, you've got um, hazels. In the middle, there's a Turkish hazel. Uh, between that and the uh, next to the Tur Turkish hazel, Typical pyramidal form, used as a street tree. The last five, ten years, all over the, all over the country, it's been used as a street tree. And uh, just to the left of that, there's another Fagus Southern Beech, uh, which was um, just after the war. It, it was felt that it, it had tremendous potential as a, as a timber tree in, in the UK. And the, the great winter of, uh, uh, of 62 to 63 absolutely decimated the, uh, uh, the all, all the. Um, North of Vegas forest that had been planted, and uh, again we didn't source, it didn't uh, get the uh, uh, best provenance tree from wherever it was in the world that we sourced the seed. And then, uh, yeah, just to the right of the Turkish hazel, there's an another monkey puzzle there. Uh, yeah, you've got hazel either side there. This is actually we'd mentioned about planting the trees at five metre spaces. There's all sorts of things going on all over the farm, so that was just a part of the farm. Here, um, we, this is quite exposed. It's well away from the hedgerow, so we've sort of planted uh, hazel windbreaks uh, at, at 10 metres intervals, and instead of planting the trees at, uh, at five metres, we've planted them at, uh, at 10 metres in between the hazels. So in the middle there is a carrier, uh, hickory, yep. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's a shagbark, that's a shagbark. We were also using sampling two or three other varieties, pecans, shellbarks, some other, other things. Uh, that is grown on pure sand there, and uh, hickories are known to like really deep soil, really deep moist soil, and uh, that is growing because of the way we're defoliating the grassland in between, alternating defoliation, we're keeping moisture levels very high in the ground. So. Uh, uh, Obviously, in the first few years, the hazels out outgrew the uh, carrier, but now the uh, hickory is really starting to take over. Uh, yeah, I mean, tremendous timber potential in this, in this country. Hickory really got to start growing the stuff. That is, uh, oh, that's an Austria, sorry. Uh, hop horn beam. Yeah, but you can see that this is one of the most exposed parts of the farm. It's well away from the hedgerow. You can see it's starting to lean a bit, so it is a bit windblown, even though it's grown quite slowly. Uh, tremendous timber, really hard, dense timber. Uh, and grows very well here. Uh, right, okay. On the left there, you've got a... Yeah, it's a persimmon. Uh, we can't grow ebony in this country. 
Uh, obviously, tremendous timber. Um, well, I, I haven't tried growing ebony. I don't know if anybody in the audience has. Uh, Persimmon is the, the same family as uh, uh, diasparus is the same family as uh, as ebony. Uh, every time we have a group around the farm, I always mention this tree, and um, you know, I, I say traditionally it was used for uh, crown green ball in the heads of golf clubs and things like that. And uh, for the first time last week, we had a, a climate group round, and uh, one of the guys said, uh, "Oh, my crown green bowling balls are made of persimmon." So, yeah. Uh, tremendous timber, really got to grow it. It only flowers and fruits on the on the female, uh, but uh, it's it's a tree we've really got to start looking at. Next to that is a, a Maclura. It's probably the most. Um, still don't know if I should 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 have grown it. There's only four, thankfully. Uh, it's the most vicious thorn tree of all. Um, we all think of stuff like hawthorn, blackthorn, uh, rabinias, and so on. The thorns, when they emerge, are very soft and they don't harden for two or three weeks. This thing, the uh, the horns are virtually like needles when they come out, when they when they come out. So it's uh, uh, I grow it because it used to be the apples, the fruit on it. Uh, it's also a orange, so uh, Maclura pomifera, so it's about the shape of an apple and so on. Uh, it used to be used as a, as a as a food for livestock in uh, in North America. Uh, if you look just in the next row behind to the right. There's uh, another McClure there, but you can see now that's leaning against the wind, against the prevailing wind. So, uh, you know, which do you collect seed from? The one that's upright or the one that's leaning? Okay. The other thing about, about uh, the silver pastoral, well, about the agroforestry is we're completely changing the way we drain the ground. The, the, the rows of trees become uh, longitudinal field drains uh, because there's no, no compaction on there. And uh, the best example I had was about 15 years ago, so it was only a few years after we started the work. We had a, a mains burst on the, uh, uh, on the road uh, al alongside the farm. And uh, all, all mains bursts hang, ha happen on a weekend. And um, it flooded, completely flooded the garden next door. Uh, went into the first alley of grass, uh, which had just been, uh, uh, just been grazed two or three days before. So that was completely compacted, so it just went across that got to where the first row of trees were, and these trees were only, like I said, only about five years established, about like that, just completely sunk in the ground. So it's a complete new way of draining the ground. And uh, because there's no compaction, I mean, this was after five years without compaction, now we're 20 odd years without compaction. So you, you guys have probably heard stories about how many insects there were, you know, 40, 50 years ago or whatever in the atmosphere. And, um, when I first started to drive in the 60s or 70s, on a day like today, within oh, five, 10 minutes, you'd have to put the windscreen wipers on because you couldn't see through the wind, windscreen for dead insects, butterflies, every, everything out there. We drove down from Roy Shropshire yesterday and uh, there were about five or 10 tiny specks on the windscreen. There's absolutely nothing out there. And uh, what, what, what is the reason? I mean, some people have said it's the, it's the change from uh, silage to, uh, from haymaking to silage because the, the grass doesn't seed anymore so there's nowhere for the insects and so on to, to lay their eggs. Uh, the next philosophy idea is that uh, we grow these diabolical uh, Armageddon crops called, called maize and uh, oil seed rape. The third one is uh, the atmosphere is completely saturated with uh, uh, transmission signals. I don't have a mobile for obvious reasons. And the fourth, fourth reason is we overdrained the land post-war. There was industrial drainage of, of farmland everywhere. And uh, the government was absolutely throwing vast amounts of subsidies to train, drain the land, which was completely and utterly stupid. And uh, with a system like this, you see, you're completely changing the way land is drained. These, I mean, there's been a lot on TV and about flooding recently, obviously. And the only way you'll ever stop flooding, you won't stop it with conventional civil engineering, engineering with, with steel and concrete, the only way you'll do it is increase the ability of the earth to absorb moisture, which is what we're doing in this sort of situation. The other thing, in the rows of grass there, the, the cattle can graze right the way under, uh, apart from a foot or, or two foot, something like that. So the grass is there, or whatever flowers, or use a lot of flowers and so on, uh, they set seed. So you've got little insect strips right the way the length of the farm. Um, right, well, I'm, yeah, yeah, it works out. Oh, you can see there, Cat Stanley on the left, on the demonstration, the extreme left there, that's uh, our Cat Stanley, named after the most football, famous football team in the world, obviously, Stanley Accrington. Um, 
You'll remember this for Stanley Accrington, apart from anything else. Right, um, this is the edge of the micro wood. Uh, next to it is the forest garden. And um, uh, we've, I mean, I, I came from urban planning 50 odd years ago, that's what I studied. And it, it still fascinates me. And uh, we, we, as, as well as completely changing the way of the English landscape. I mean, the problem with the English landscape is that now we've still got a landscape that's dictated to by the Middle Ages by sheep farming, wool farming. And we've, if we're going to start doing anything about climate, we've got to completely change the way the English farm landscape is. Anyway, the, this is the, uh, uh, the, like I said, the forest garden next door. This is uh, the small woodland, micro wood. And uh, we need to fill our towns and cities up with these micro woods and forest gardens, any bit of space, they should be filled, like, filled up with things like this. I have a great difficulty when I have a group at, around the farm and they get in the forest garden, they get in the micro wood. I'm gagging for a drink or something to eat, and they won't come out, so uh, my, my problem. <laughs> all right, okay. That, that's all, folks, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. That was, that was so interesting. Um, I was really hesitated to speed you up towards the end there, because you, you said to yourself that you could go on for hours on this topic, but thanks for being disciplined. Um, yeah, actually, you talked about the five to ten insect strikes on your car coming down from Shropshire. Somebody yesterday said there were, they had three insects on their windscreen coming from Kent. So it made me think that maybe we should have got everybody to count, and then we could have had a, kind of like an interesting citizen science project going on there. Um, but... Um, Brilliant. Bugs matter. Look out for the app on your phone. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, and just to say, as I mentioned, there's a session at 11 about the um, benefits of trees to livestock. So going into some of the more detail that Peter mentioned from his silver pasture system. But let's have a, a time of um, discussion and question and answers now. And um, if, I, if you don't mind me steering this a little bit, because um, of our folk, climate change focus, I suggest that we try and keep our questions to sort of uh, questions to Andy and Peter about the adaptation benefits, about the, the resilience of their, their, their agroforestry, um, but also you know, to share your experience of dealing with, with weather events, with climate change, how you're, de how you're dealing with that, how you're thinking about it in terms of the future planning for agroforestry, that kind of, if you'd like to share your experience, that'd be brilliant as well. So there's a couple of roving mics that Jerry and Will, I think, have got coming, coming or somebody's got coming around. So, um, yeah, just put your hand up, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, a uh, question for Peter. Uh, looks like you've got quite a range of different tree species, so looking at resilience through diversification. Uh, looks like you're alternating between a species and ash, using an ash as kind of a, a nurse. Are you suffering from dieback, and what are your plans to, to replace ash in the future? Yeah, I missed, missed, missed the slide about dying trees. The people who visit are absolutely amazed how little ash dieback damage there is. Uh, we had, a, um, I think, Rothamsted, who planted a lot of ash about the same time as us, found out that the ash trees near, uh, near uh, streams and in more moisture retentive places were all right. And, uh, uh, the ones in drier areas succumb to ash dieback, and uh, it's um, th there's two or three trees got it reasonably bad, but they're all pulling through. And I, again, I think it's the way we're defoliating and refoliating the grassland in between, so we're not losing the the ground moisture. If you see what I mean, so we're retaining as much moisture as we can. And uh, obviously these trees aren't, aren't in isolation, so they're in rows, so they're all sheltering each other from the heat of the sun. You know, midday is, is the biggest problem. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's been interesting this last week or two about some of the ash. Uh, there's been a lot of defoliation on the ash before this hot weather started. In fact, a couple of trees, have, apart from uh, a few of the very young leaves right at the top, they've completely defoliated. So what's going on, the more you know about trees, the less you know about trees sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just bought, uh, bought ash trees from um, uh, a, lo a local forest nursery and planted them in. And um, they seem to have been, interestingly, one or two that have had it were in the very early days, first two or three years they were established, were, were stripped by caterpillars. So where there's a connection, 
I don't know. I'm, I'm not a scientist, but it's interesting. And we do sample very slowly. We've got a couple of North American varieties of ash and so on. So it's not all, uh, uh, it's not all, all fr fractionless excelsior. So, yeah. Hi, uh, this is probably a question for um, both of you, just to get thoughts on, um, so for replanting or planting a new woodland, um, mainly kind of more of a woodland rather than necessarily the agroforestry, um, you hear a lot about just focusing on like British native trees and the fact that we need to, you know, they're the best for the insects and things like that. But just to get your thoughts, because it sounds like you have a lot of yeah, non-British ones and how you're finding for in terms of for climates and the future um, for plant trees here. Yeah, I mean, I've always, uh, I studied for a year, studied British ecology and conservation. And when I learned now what the definition of a native tree was, it's incredibly arbitrary. They've just picked a date in history. As a veg farmer, what I see with uh, um, natural uh, animals uh, is constant migration, you know? I have new pests turn up on my veg farm all the time and they migrate from the continent and they come across as the climate warms up. I think, um, and interestingly, I do a lot of um, presentations on what's called integrated pest management and so controlling pests in horticulture. Um, and a, a big part of that is I talk about all, you know, everyone introduces loads of predatory insects into their cropping areas. They buy them off big companies. All the predators you need are in the hedge just there, yeah? So I'm a bit conflicted about the subject, if I'm honest. Because on the one hand, I know the stuff I want to protect my crops already exists in the hedgerow there in all the native species. So 50% of me is like, right, I want to use native species because that will attract the insects just over there in the hedge out into the middle of the field and do that same job here. At the same time, um, non-native, if you walk around a botanic garden in England, non-native plants and non-native trees are covered in UK insects. So I think... Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm conflicted. I, I don't really believe in the term native, I suppose, you know. And I believe plants, animals, people have always moved around planet Earth and all, will always move around planet Earth. And you have to work within that system. Oh, do you want me? Uh, right, OK. Um, I'm not conflicted at all. Uh, I mean, the, the reason... Um, uh, how should I say this? Um, I haven't got a lot of time for the Woodland Trust, to be quite honest. I think the thing, I could go into, I could spend an hour or two talking about that, but I won't do. Um, I, we need to look at trees completely differently. I mean, I mean what we've lost in the last, you know, the, the problems with, uh, with oak trees, with ash trees, with uh, elm trees, with, uh, with uh, horse chestnut trees, well, they're not native anyway. Um, I mean, what are we doing? You know, we removed all the insects that, fed on all these trees and so on, and now we expect them to, uh, all the predators of all these trees, and now we expect them to su survive without the predators. So we've just got to open our minds. Our minds are just so close. You know, it's like I was saying about the, the planning. We've completely changed the way field system on the farm, we've completely changed the way the field systems are created. We're so com conflicted in this country by um, our, our field systems, which are completely wrong. You know, they were all right three, four hundred years ago, sheep farming. They're no re relevance today with, with the way climate is. We've got a, I mean, it, it's almost, I, 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 some of us call it a, a concept of total farming in, in, in deference to Johan Cruyff, who was a great footballer. Because you're, you're, um, you're, you're bringing trees, you're bringing forestry and agriculture together. You're not dividing them, which is the whole point of, uh, of uh, agroforestry. We've got to stop that group think. It's wrong. Hi there, uh, thank you for the presentations. This is just a quick, more practical question, uh, mainly for Peter. You mentioned collecting the seeds off the trees and some of the Chinese hybrid sort of trees you were talking about as well. When you get them as seedlings, this is more a practical question, are you establishing them before you kind of into little seedlings or saplings before you plant them? I was wondering how um, you actually establish best way to do that in terms of timing with growing the trees? Yeah, I, I mean, w w when I started this, I couldn't afford to buy the trees, and some of the trees I couldn't get anyway, so I just bought seed from here, there, and everywhere. Uh, I plant uh, them when they're about that tall. Okay. A couple of foot tall, something like that. Um, 
any taller and the, in open fields, in, any taller than that, and you have a dry spring, I mean, dry springs are the ultimate nightmare. And uh, any taller than that, they'll just desiccate. And um, um, interestingly, I, uh, 18 months ago, I planted a, an aspen, uh, my, my namesake. Uh, never planted one before, and in the very dry, hot weather last year, uh, it just, all its leaves died. I thought it was completely dead. I just walked down the field with a couple of buckets of water, took them on it. Two weeks later, it had greened up. It was amazing, quite amazing. So accidents do happen from time to time, but uh, in an open field system, like, like you were saying, I think you need to plant earlier in the season, November, December, January, rather than later. Does that answer your question, or is that a bit vague? Sorry about that. So there's a question down here in the middle, um, but, and then, then towards the back, yeah. Um, thank you, and thank you for the presentations. I thought, I thought they were brilliant. Um, just picking up a little bit on the conversation around species, uh, I think, you know, because resilience in terms of climate change, I think, is very much a function of a landscape as opposed to the function of the crop. And I just wondered whether is there potentially too much um, kind of put on the species selection when it comes to resilience, which is potentially kind of divesting research or interest away from building resilience at that landscape level with kind of, you know, the mutual reactions with uh, trees and soil and kind of all the other ecosystems within a landscape. Because there has been a lot of focus on species today and I just wondered, is that is that being driven by kind of, what what, what is driving that and kind of at what level does resilience matter to farmers? You, the, the one thing I'd like to just... I didn't mention it enough in my thing, but I, I mentioned it right at the beginning. I grow 90 different kinds of fruit and vegetables. The main reason for that is resilience, is that there is literally... The, the weather pattern does not exist that makes all 90 of those crops perform in a grade A way. It, it, that cannot happen. But that is the commercial resilience of the business, that whatever weather pattern we get, enough of those crops perform commercially to make it successful. Now, I'd apply exactly the same thing to trees. So I think the key thing, it, there's species selection in it, but within that species selection is you have to maximise diversity. You know, monocultures just aren't natural. They don't exist anywhere on Earth. So whatever tree system you're designing, species, and I think there are, it all, when I said about every farm is different, and you're, you, what, what, what are you designing your system for? That question will define the species. You know, it's not, it, it, that, that should be, so what am I looking for from this agroforestry system for my farm or for this particular field and these particular crops? And that should be driving your species selection. But it takes a lot, I mean, this gentleman next to me has obviously learned a hell of a lot about trees in the last 20, 30 years because it takes a long time. There's a hell of a lot of different trees. So I think your species selection needs to be led by the purpose of the trees but also, you just need to learn. I mean, it's, it's almost an endless choice. So I don't think there is a singular right species for the right, for the right place. I think many different species could do the same job. But almost it's down to how limited your knowledge on tree species is. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't mention, actually, that the, um, using conifers, you must not just use deciduous trees. I mean, if, if you want a mixed woodland are far more diverse, species diverse than... Uh, than uh, either just deciduous or just conifer uh, woodlands. And um, it's often said that the woodland edges are the most, where you get the most uh, bird life, the most insect life and, and whatnot. And uh, in effect, what these rows of trees, they all become woodland edges, if you see what I mean. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm still sampling. I'm still taking out some trees and if I can get some seed from somewhere, uh, another tree, I'm still digging up some trees after 20 odd years. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wish I'd just planted 20 odd years ago, I just planted ash and walnuts through the whole farm. It would have been so much an easier life, but I, I still like to experiment and see what's working and what's not. Uh, yeah, it's, the, uh, it's, the, uh, it's, it's what I have to bear. If you see what I mean. If I could just add to that, I mean, I think that there are some really interesting questions about resilience at that landscape level. I guess your, your guys' focus is the farm enterprise for obvious reasons, but you know, we're talking about insects earlier, weren't we? And I think um, you know, it's the role of, of trees and other sorts of habitats for that kind of ecological connectivity you know, over much wider spaces, which is a whole bundle of research going on on that. You know, I think, isn't the, is it the Bumblebee Conservation Trust that have identified these super highways for, for bees and other pollinators across the country? Um, and um, there's that kind of work which actually helps to identify 
the role of trees and also, yeah, meadows, whatever, for those ecological corridor sort of properties, yeah. But Could I mention one thing? We, we, in January, we had a, we don't get many visitors in January, but we had a busload of students from Harper Adams. And uh, the guys, the lecturers that came with them, one was a, a, a Ben Forrester down in the Weald, down Kent, where, and the other was a soil scientist. And uh, none of the students and none of the lecturers had been in an in a, uh, agroforestry system before. Why the hell they were lecturing, I don't know. And um, they, um, I'd just been explaining how we were controlling pests. The, 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 the forester said he'd never been in a new woodland where there hadn't been any squirrel damage. And uh, I explained how, the, if you look back at the picture of the, of the alleys, uh, they were the perfect hunting ground for birds of prey. And, um, and a few minutes after I said this to him, there was a kestrel just overhead. We don't get many in the middle of winter. And uh, then another 10 minutes later, there was a squirrel, but it was uh, being very careful. It was just walking up the, uh, uh, up the hedgerow, being very careful, in and out, in and out. It wouldn't cross the killing field, what I call the alleys, the killing fields, because uh, they, it, we all know about grey squirrels in, in parks and so on, where the, the, uh, the, you know, the grass is mown to a half an inch. But if you see uh, squirrels in, uh, uh, in, in long grass, or even four or five inch grass, they move like otters, they move like that and that, so they're very vulnerable to predation. And we haven't had any, uh, in the forest gardens on the second year running, we haven't had any uh, predation of, uh, of walnuts or hazelnuts. We had some friends, friends around a couple of weeks ago, just, uh, we just spent the evening picking hazelnuts because there was no predation whatsoever. So um, there's an answer to everything if you, if you keep looking for it. And this seems to be an answer to having alleys. Uh, it seems to be the answer, an answer to, uh, I won't say the answer, an answer to grey squirrel predation. Yeah, just a quick question about thinning of the trees. Is there a sort of trigger that you're looking for in your grass growth or your veg that would then make you think, right, it's time to start thinking about thinning some of these trees? And when you have thinned, what do you actually do with the, the timber that you've produced? Uh, oh, oh you you go? Go? Uh, I've lived at the farm 40 odd years, and um, for moral reasons, I've never used oil and gas to heat the f house. No, we just use, uh, we all know what we've got to mess in with oil and gas now, so I just use off peak electricity and timber. And last year, uh, I spent three or four months up a ladder every fine day pruning the, um, well I did the walnut trees, you've got to prune walnut trees in, in late autumn and uh, all the ash trees because uh, the problem with tractors these days, they're so tall we've got to reinvent the tractor, make much shorter tractors to get under the uh, branches so uh, I spend a lot of time pruning trees, my knees and, and ankles were pretty much gone it took a week or two to recover, great fun you see a lot, uh, you see a lot in the sky when you up, up a tree on a ladder Go on, Andy. <laughs> so, and we design with veg the the shading aspects, which might be a benefit in some situations. That's something you've got to manage very, very carefully with veg. You know, it's not it's different to a silver pasture system. The trees we've picked. So we did in the field. There are 100 apple trees. They're all on 106 rootstock, and that's for two reasons. We don't want full standard apple trees because they'll cast too much shade, basically. And also, 106 keeps the picking from the ground. So it speeds up the picking way, way quicker. It's not on a dwarf rooting stock or a semi-dwarfing stock. It's sort of semi-vigorous. Uh, it's an organic system. It's what I'd call low input, so there's no sprays. There's no fertility management on the trees. We rely on inherent fertility within the whole field where we use a lot of cover crops. Um, so that's the apples. So that, that, they, they never get too big, really. They never need thinning. I prune them from a commercial perspective. I'm actually getting to the point where I think, actually, maybe I'm not even going to bother pruning. I kind of think a tree knows how to grow itself, and sometimes we get too over-involved with it. I'm also actually looking at growing apple trees not on rootstocks. I think they become a lot more disease resistant on their own genuine rootstock than they do when you cut it and glue it to something else. Um, and then coppice trees, so alder and hazel, they will only ever get to five... The whole plan is a five-year rotation. They'll probably get to about five metres high. Um, that was planned, five metres high will give me 50 metres of wind protection and there's 50 metres between my widest tree rows. Um, and then the only ones in there that I'm keeping an eye on height-wise, but we knew they were going to get tall, but that's why we didn't put very many in there, is the wild cherries. The other ones we put in for wildlife are spindle and elder. Neither of those 
get, for me, in veg terms, get dangerously high and cast too much shade. At the ends of some of the rows, we've chucked in a few oaks and things because they're such amazing um, features in the landscape for biodiversity. But again, they're the, the southern, the northern ends of rows where they're not going to cast shade onto the crops. So yeah, thinning, we kind of pre-planned not to do any, basically. Yeah. The most important tree I find for bi biodiversity is alder buckthorn. Uh, it flowers for four or five months of the year. And we've got one in the, uh, in the, in the micro wood there. And uh, it, can be, it can be raining. And the, the insects and the bees and so on are working the flowers. So if you plant one tree in your garden this winter, plant an alder buckthorn. Makes the finest charcoal as well. I think we've got time for one more question. Uh. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. It was really, really great. Um, I wanted to, it maybe it's too specific, and if it is, we can take it afterwards. But um, you were talking a lot about wind and how that affects uh, the growth of the trees. It, have you tried to uh, like have, create a gradient from the from the alleys? The, 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 so it's quite a, quite a harsh and quite a distinct difference between the, the high trees and then the grass is have you experimented with creating a gradient there to protect some of the trees you mentioned didn't put on the girth that you expected is that something that that you've experimented with to uh... well i think in time they will put the girth on i mean you know, it, it was the uh, hybrid walnuts i think i, I said i hadn't put much girth on they, but they put the height on and they've been very w wind resistant uh they're about 30 foot tall now after 20 years so they've grown pretty well uh, in time, they'll put girth on, um, you know, and then you've got to put them in rotation. I mean, every tree on the farm, probably even conifers, people don't realise a lot of conifers can be, uh, can be coppiced. So if you, if you take them down, if you're on a 40, 50, 60 year rotation, those trees I've planted could well be there in another 500,000 years, you know, if they're managed properly. It's a case of managing trees and people, not a lot of people know how to manage trees properly. I'm still learning. Great. OK. Um, I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But can I just ask Andy and Peter, just for a one sentence piece of advice for people embarking on agroforestry in a climate change context? Just one piece of advice, <laughs> but apart from planting buckthorn all the... <laughs> uh, don't experiment too much. If you're going to experiment with tree species, just, just do it on a small part of your farm. Otherwise, just be, like I said, if I just planted ash, walnuts, uh, Aracarias on my farm, my life, my last 20 years would have been a lot easier. Keep it simple, keep it simple. Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage people to, farmers to knowledge up and design their own systems, don't pick something off a shelf someone else has done. Uh, every farm's unique. Brilliant, okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>